Assalamu alaikum, you're watching Views and News and I'm Faisal Rahman live from our Islamabad studios. Earlier you were uh, listening to the Prime Minister of Pakistan, Mr. Imran Khan and uh, interestingly some great packages uh, have been announced by the PM. Uh, I think hats off uh, to the current government regarding uh, the decrease in the oil and petroleum products. And amazingly 10 rupees per litre has been slashed whereas the entire globe is expecting that the fuel prices will go further up in the coming days and rather coming weeks because of the Ukrainian crisis and the uh, shortage as far as the production is concerned and perhaps a lot more uh, than that also. Another great announcement again despite the fact that Ogra the other day announced that there could be an increase in the electricity prices by rupees 6 per unit whereas what we heard from the Prime Minister was the opposite. He said that 5 rupees will be reduced per unit. So that is, I think, a great news for not only uh, the domestic consumers or perhaps for the uh, people who are into the field of industry. I think their cost of production is definitely go to, going to go down. Another important factor now, how the IMF is going to react to it, because they had in fact advised that the petroleum levy and the petroleum prices should be increased, whereas there should be more increase as far as the electricity is concerned. SR's program, in fact, uh, which has received um, international acclaim, uh, prices have been increased there as well. And when you talk about per family, I think there is a huge uh, a difference that will be seen because it has been appreciated by all the financial institutions as well as by a lot of countries also. When you talk about Seth Card, I was surprised to know during these uh, cricket matches when um, uh, PSL was being held that this is the largest in fact uh, benefit given to any uh, country by the government. Uh, interestingly, 1 million rupees you can go to any government hospital or perhaps you can choose to go to a private uh, hospital or a clinic there as well. For a family, 10 million, uh, 1 million, this is 10 lakh rupees, is, is amazing. Uh, whereas he also uh, spoke about the growth rate that we have achieved, that is around 5.3%, despite the fact while the entire globe was under a lot of pressure. And the pressure was primarily because of Corona and the supplies I'll just give you one example that a 20-foot container that used to cost around $4,200 is being booked at $20,000 now. So you can well imagine uh, what uh, has been going on. And uh, other than that, as far as our foreign policy is concerned, he talked about that also. He, in fact, mentioned about his recent visit to Russia. Prime, prior to that, he was in China. I think the top leaders of the world, uh, they met the prime minister, and I think Pakistan is now in a different league altogether. People, a lot of uh, 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 from various countries, especially from India, they criticize that Pakistan is always carrying a begging bowl and perhaps uh, they do not have any say and as far as their foreign policy is concerned, they, they have no way to go. But I think it's the opposite. Pakistan has registered its name among those countries which matter, not only to China, not only to Russia, not only to European Union, perhaps to Americans even now, despite the fact that we know that the Americans are having a strategic uh, kind of a relationship with the Indians. But having said that, I think Pakistan has a major a global role to play now. Now, interestingly, we'll be talking about that. Let me quickly introduce you to our panelists. And uh, today we have uh, both the panelists on Skype. We have with us uh, from Germany, Mr. Harley Slanger. He's a political analyst. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Stanger, for your time. And uh, we also have with us uh, Dr. Uh, Jamil Khansa, former ambassador, senior diplomat. So, pleasure to have you in the show. Gentlemen, thank you so much uh, for your time. Now, talking about uh, a quick uh, recap of the Prime Minister's speech. Jamil Saab, let me start off from you. So, a couple of great news uh, for the nation, I would say. Reduction and significant reduction in the petroleum prices a very significant reduction in the electricity prices. And uh, we have with us rather right now, uh, Shaukat Tareen Saab, the finance minister with us uh, on the telephone line. Tareen Saab, pleasure to have you on the show, sir. Thank you so much for your time. Now, talking about two great news sir, for the nation. One is about the reduction in the petroleum prices, a very significant one, 10 rupees almost to 12. They have been slashed, whereas the Ogra opted for a different option as far as electricity is concerned. 
we were expecting 10 rupees per unit to be increased. Rather, it has been the opposite. 5 rupees has been slashed. Now, you talk about the Sehat card, you talk about the SRS program. So, brilliant ideas. Let's talk about that. Your take. Yeah, of course. You see, uh, uh, we have realized that you know people, people have been under pressure because of this uh, commodity super cycle. And as international petroleum prices have gone up, LNG prices have gone up, they put you know, a lot of pressure on, you know, uh, on Pakistan because we import all these things. So I think, you know, but in a major departure from what we have been doing and what other uh, governments have been doing around the world, we basically have just said that uh, let's give, uh, you know, people of uh, Pakistan a relief. Although, you know, our petrol prices are much lower than, you know, the other countries. Uh, for example, you know, our per liter cost is 159 and India is 260. But still, I mean, you know, uh, we thought that uh, people are suffering. So the Ogra summary was that we should increase this by 9 rupees and 41 pesos. So that meant that, you know, this should have gone up to 100 and uh 68 uh, rupees uh, but we reduced it to 149 so just imagine we just slashed it by 20 rupees exactly also actually, we, yeah. we have we have also said that we if they will remain the same you know for for the next four months but that's more significant you know one time you know you know reduction we just did uh, you know we did not increase two weeks ago uh, the price of uh, petroleum, but that was one time. Now we are saying for four months, people can heave a sigh of relief that the petrol prices will not go up, uh, you know, for the next four months. And we are hoping that the, the super cycle, you know, starts ebbing once, you know, the, the heat on Ukraine, you know, subsides and, you know, the super cycle just goes down, you know, uh, by, by the summer. The second one is, you know, obviously electricity. And electricity is also dependent on the petroleum. And 60% of our, you know, electricity is produced by hydrocarbons. Mm -hmm. So it means that uh, uh, it, it would have uh, increased, you know, especially the, the quarterly adjustments would have increased. But we have not only incre not, in, not increased, we have reduced, you know, by uh, you know, for 95% of the population, the cost has gone down by 20 to 50 percent. You know. So these are significant, but more we, we also have uh, done other things like this internship program for uh, graduates. You know, we, you know we, uh, we have introduced that. We, have, we, we will be talking to these large corporates who basically have made a lot of money and will tell them to just increase the salary of their employees by at least 15 to 20 percent. We have again, you know, you know that the Kamyab Pakistan program, which was limited to KP and uh, Balochistan, uh, we are launching from, you know, uh, the day after tomorrow, whole of Pakistan, which will, will, will disperse <coughs> minimum of 100 to 150 billion in one year and around 400 billion in two years. And these are interest-free loans, you know, for, agri for agriculture, uh, for uh, business, for house, homes. And so I think, and then Kamyab Jawan. Uh, SAS is again increased their stipend from 12,000 to 14,000. So all these things, and this, this obviously you add on the universal health uh, insurance. So all these things, you know, we, we, we point to, towards Prime Minister saying that he always says two things. He says, I want to create a welfare state and I want to make sure that, you know, we have rule of law. So this all is right. all towards that. Now, Tareen Saab, I think that is a great relief. But if I could uh, ask you a question here, and that is regarding the IMF. Because whenever we talk about IMF, we've been doing so many shows on that particular issue. We always hear that IMF dictates terms and conditions, and they make sure that whatever they want should be done. Now, sir, it's the other way around. That's what we see right now regarding the petroleum prices 
and the electricity prices. And uh, since the uh, Prime Minister has promised that they will remain unchanged for the next four, month, four months. Now, looking at the Ukrainian crisis or otherwise uh, the way the petroleum products are going up, over $100 a barrel now. And same the case is with furnace oil that we import. So the case is with so many other commodities that we import. Uh, so the case is with the supply chain also, as you just mentioned rightly about the commodity super cycle. Now, uh, uh, finance ministers have tell us that uh, are we in a financial position to in fact retain that for the next four months because this is the real relief uh, for the general public sir you know we are we have not uh, we have not violated anything we have promised the imf we will deliver the fiscal deficit which we have uh, promised we are not going to increase our debt i mean all this is to, through savings in different programs so we have decided that, you know, instead of building few roads, I mean, you might as well just, you know, basically give a relief to your to your population. And and similarly, you know, we have cut corners in different, uh, you know, expenses. And this is, you know, homegrown. So I should not have any problem because all they are saying is that, you know, your, your expense, uh, you know, uh, should be under control, which which will be under control. And so we don't we, we don't see any problem with the IMF. Right, and we have, some, we have already... So one more uh, important uh, point, uh, uh, Tareen Saab, if you could listen to me. And that is about the youth. Obviously, sir, youth is the, I think that is the most important ingredient, especially when you talk about that 65% of our population is perhaps well under the age of 30. Now, sir... Demographic dividend or demographic disaster. Now, you are talking about the dividend here. So, you're talking about a huge sum, 100 to 150. And later on, by the next year, it could go up to 400 billion rupees uh, for the Kamyab Pakistan or Kamyab Jawan program. Sir, uh, entrepreneurship is something that actually is the backbone of any economy, sir. How do you see that, sir? Do you believe that we have that kind of a conducive environment and that kind of a support system and the ecosystem that exists? Uh, which can really uh, flourish and make people believe in themselves and grow? Absolutely. The very fact is that this is a program which is very well structured. Initially, there were apprehensions by IMF and the World Bank. And once we have seen it work, because we had the pilot in KPK and Balochistan, uh, Azad Kashmir and Gilgit Baltistan, and we've seen that, that it is seamless. It is very transparent totally based on merit. And they're, they're very impressed. And as a matter of fact, you know, there's no government intervention except, you know, that we're going to be giving, you know, the subsidies which are uh, to be given uh, to these uh, uh, NGOs and uh, non-banking financial institutions who are going to be distributing these loans. Uh, and by the way, these, these institutions have been doing it for the last 30 years, and they're Loss ratios are just one to two percent, which means their recoveries are ninety-eight to ninety-nine percent. That's brilliant. It's a very, very well thought out, you know, uh, I mean, uh, kind of initiative. And uh, you know, the fact is that we are we are helping the uh, you know the farmer. We are helping you know uh, the people at the lower start out do uh, their own business. Actually, what we are trying to do. Uh, is, is that we want people to catch, I uh, want to teach them how to catch fish, not want to give them fish. And that is what will galvanize the lower, uh, you know, uh, strata uh, of our, uh, you know, population, will make entrepreneurs out of them. And this is going to be a very, very unique experiment, you know, amongst the, the, the developing nations. I don't think even in the developed nations they have programs like this. So we, if we can hit the four million, uh, you know, households in the next four or five years, and and then you know, then then and then and go up to six million and eight million, and create entrepreneurship over there, that's what 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 will change the destination of our. So that that's how the economies grow. That's how the countries progress. Uh, so quick question regarding the IT. I think another brilliant initiative taken by the Prime Minister because this is the future, sir. We are all talking about the artificial intelligence. Just imagine one single application um, in, in USA that was created in the Silicon Valley is worth over a trillion. 
dollars. Just imagine, this is the kind of strength one can have. But I think, sir, Prime Minister has done a great, uh, uh, I think, um, he's taken a brilliant step regarding that. Tell us about that quickly, sir. And the last question uh, would be about uh, the future growth plan, sir, if you could talk about it. Okay. Firstly, I just, uh, I chair this uh, committee on IT. And so my view is that Pakistan is, you know, you know uh, survival lies in, you know, uh, growing IT because, you know, we have a major gap between imports and exports. Correct. Our exports are going to grow, but so, uh, so would our imports. So what is going to grow much faster than our imports is going to be IT. And frankly, also tourism, because tourism also, you know, we have, you know, beautiful, you know, uh, kind of uh, areas which we can exploit. So let's stick to the IT. So I've just basically told, you know, I asked the IT people that you grew by, you know, around 47% last year. This year you're going to grow by 75%. Tell me if you, I want you to grow by 100% year on year for the next, you know, many, many years. So what do you want me to do? And they said these two things at least. And so, you know, I just told the Prime Minister, please announce we will give them tax relief. We will give them, uh, allow them to, you know, open foreign currency accounts and, and, and frankly have freedom. So I think uh, why? Because I believe that, you know, in five to six years time, we could hit $50 billion of exports. And if I, we, uh, by then, if our Remittances are around, you know, 50 million, uh, around, uh, you know, 40 million dollars. Then, you know, between the two of them, there'll be 90 million dollars. And, you know, if the uh, export of goods right, is right. another, you know, you know, uh, 60, 70 million dollars. I mean, you could be at, you know, probably 160, 170 billion dollars. And I think that we will be a major exporting country. We, we hope and we pray and we believe. Last question, sir. Since whenever we talk about the economic growth, normally a digit comes in our mind, 6%, 5.5%. But, sir, two major factors, and those are about the social development. One is health, one is education. As far as health is concerned, sir, I think Sehat Card is a brilliant program. When you talk about education, we just learned that a lot of uh, internships would be given, a lot of loans would be given to the students also. Now, sir, one thing that is about, like we used to have these polytechnical institutes where skillful workers were prepared, not only for domestic consumption, but for export also. Any program regarding that, sir? Education develops, you know, without developing the human resource. As you said, I think at the start that, you know, we have a youth bulge which can be a winner for us or it can also sink us. So the very fact is that we want to have, you know, population dividend and we have to take care of our, you know, population, the human resource. Japan, after all, and if you see Singapore and a few other countries, they only have human resource. They don't have material resources and they are, you know, one of the uh, most successful economies. <laughs> so we will have to take care of our human resource, develop it and then and make sure that they have the country. Now, you talked about the growth. So the final question was, you know, what, what do I think about the growth? I think we are growing. This economy is growing. If we, I remove these, if we, uh, shadows of the super cycle, commodity super cycle, we will be probably growing around, you know, close to 5%. We have to start, you know, making it, you know, uh, more sustainable. And if we have to make it sustainable, we have to increase our savings rate. We have to bridge the gap between imports and exports. And we have to make the economy more productive, agriculture and industry. And we are working on all those initiatives. All the best. Thank you. Now, the next topic that is about the crisis in Europe. And uh, a lot of development um, has taken place over a period of uh, a few days. And uh, now, uh, fighting is going on in Ukraine, as we all know. But the good news is uh, that uh, there are talks uh, that are scheduled at the uh, 
Ukrainian and uh, Belarusian uh, border where the Ukrainian uh, deputy foreign minister along with the defense minister will be meeting the cultural minister of Russia and uh, they'll be talking about the future and uh, we all hope that uh, they, they should be fruitful so there should be uh, some sort of a ceasefire at the end of the day lives matter. Now to talk about that I have already uh, told you that uh, we have with us on Skype Mr. Harley Slanger from Germany and uh, Dr. Jamil Khan uh, the former ambassador uh, from uh, uh, Karachi. Uh, now uh, gentlemen um, uh, since uh, earlier uh, we had with us uh, the finance minister so uh, uh, we had to talk about uh, the prime minister's speech but coming and talking about the Ukrainian crisis if I may put the first question to ambassador uh, Jamil Khan sir. sir Nuclear threat number one, uh, since uh, they have been activated, uh, the Defense Minister of Russia as well as the Chief of General Staff of Russia, they were told to remain alert. Now, coming that from Mr. Putin, sir, that means a lot. And now the Europeans are not only uh, giving the uh, technical weapons uh, to the Ukrainian military and the public in general to fight, but they have also offered that we'll be giving you most likely MiG-29s. Uh, they are already in use with the Ukrainians and other support worth around 450 million euros. Sir, so where is Europe heading? Because if this continues, this could lead to a mega disaster. Your take, Jamil Saab first. No, definitely. All these, all these indicators which uh, we are monitoring, uh, that's not really very promising. As a matter of fact, it's really uh, putting the entire world in a, in a lot of anxiety, basically. And um, if I may just share with you some of those factual positions and the statements of the two head of states, that is the, uh, Mr. Putin and uh, Mr. Biden, both. So I'll come on that. But basically, the nuclear uh, nuclear alert is the most alarming thing which uh, we are hearing now. And it's for the first time after Cuba crisis exactly that this after 1962, stage has come yes. to this level. That's right. It has come to this level. Uh, and this is it. It's, uh, then the uh, uh, U.S. and its allies, European countries, they are making its assessment. But during this assessment, they are also saying that uh, uh, there could be a miscalculation. The way things are really heating up uh, 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 and taking a new trajectory every day. The NATO chief says that uh, we have also kept uh, ready about 100 jets and about 120 ships. You know, imagine. Uh, on alert and those ships are not only uh, used for the conventional purposes they are used for the nuclear purposes also um, then they say well they are they, they are all response force they, they, that is ready um, you have already mentioned in your intro about uh, the kind of weapons which are pouring in into uh, ukraine and uh, the street fights the dog fights has started in so many cities um, in uh, ukraine so uh, all these factors attributing uh, uh, and, uh, towards a higher level of tension, as a matter of fact, and uh, the, the world, the world is now uh, so far there's uh, hardly any effort. Today's sanction, which has been which has been imposed um, just a, a little while ago, which is a swift uh, system, uh, Russia has been taken out, uh, which is one of the one of one of the toughest sanctions. I, to my best of memory. There is hardly any country except Iran, and this is going to be Russia this time. So uh, this swift system, it is coming out. Uh, Russia would have a real difficult time, and so is the case with all those countries which are having uh, the, any kind of a trade and uh, business with the Russia. What does it imply? And this is what our uh, Prime Minister was also mentioning, the impact of such crisis. Afghanistan, he mentioned the impact of Afghan issue on Pakistan and now more importantly on all the countries of the world, more importantly the underdeveloping countries. Uh, the, the, what is going to happen to them this crisis and under these, under this backdrop, it was really mind-boggling that uh, the kind of uh, reduction in fuel process, pr prices have been, have been um, announced today, fuel prices and that electricity prices. Um, if Mr. Tareen had not said that how, the, how he is going to really cut the corner, and also how, how the money is being uh, gathered for, the funds are being gathered for uh, uh, offsetting this. Uh, this is going to have a direct impact on the poor people of Pakistan. You know, because fuel prices means an indirect direct, um, enhancement in the, uh, in, the, in the taxes 
and the price it impacts each sector of the country and particularly the most uh, uh, worstly hit uh, section of the society is the poorest section of the society so that's one Correct. good news and i, I really am quite quite thrilled that this is this is what has happened and the, the, he has already explained the finance minister has explained so coming back on us uh, the the, uh, the ukraine and the um, the us uh, the, the the russia and the us standoff i would say at this point time so coming back from that this is going to bring more difficulties around the world so far as economics is concerned but this nuclear part of it is uh, 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 something which needs to be de-escalated and so many countries now are um, siding with the allies and so is the case russia uh, the, the, it is expected it was expected in security council meeting and now it's expected in the general assembly meeting uh, the countries now have to come up show their cards so that would have two impacts number one that it would start uh, uh, bringing countries into blocks uh, which we never wanted you know as a matter of fact and also uh, this is going to have a direct um, the realignment and the geopolitical landscape it appears is going to change very soon uh, i may also draw your attention uh, the the uh, harmonization of so many thoughts although uh, the statement of china is uh, slightly different but uh, in so many uh, the uh, uh, fields the china and russia they are working together including space weaponization and space weaponization they have progressed so much both these countries that it has almost come parallel to the to us and its allies so all the factors if we if if we consider then in that case this set of teams to be quite difficult but a bigger question which i am hearing that most of most of the channels and i'm being asked this question too and that is a nuclear uh, flash point um at this stage with all these posturing what is has happened uh, it doesn't appear that uh, it will just trigger off the third world war or something because the, the all these countries they understand it quite well that uh, third world war or a nuclear uh, 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 use of u- u- nuclear weapon is a mutual destruction of the entire world so that appears Absolutely. but as the us saying is is the accidental thing war can start but it can it can go into multifaceted multifaceted directions and Absolutely. there could be an accident there could be and, a, and so that, that, that that's that's, that's what we we've, we've been hearing also because if you switch on the western channels european or american or canadian or any other obviously uh, one concept is totally anti russia earlier uh, there was this um, the press conference um, uh, between uh, the german foreign um, uh, minister as well as the slovenian foreign minister and they talked about it we also got to know that the germans they really want to now this question is for you mr harley uh, that uh, the germans really want that they should also beef up the security they should buy new weapons new technologies uh, all sorts of uh, you know uh, uh, the the material support the military assets so that uh, the the security of germany should be taken care of 2% of the gdp now that is something which we never heard of but this could be and germany could not be the only country so many other countries as um, uh, the western media says that uh, the finland could be invaded poland could be invaded uh, perhaps uh, romania could be invaded now we have to support them so that support on one side the commitment of the russians on the other side the kind of forces they have that is a recipe for a perfect huge disaster perfect disaster that can be avoided but unfortunately so far things are not that great your take sir well i have to say living in germany when i heard about the reduction in petroleum prices in pakistan and cutting electricity rates maybe you're going to see a lot of german refugees coming into pakistan because the electricity rates are going up by 40% the last yes. two months in germany exactly. before the cutting of nord stream 2 and the gas prices are going up so the question is what's gotten into the german chancellor and the german government in the last couple of days you know the the situation between russia and ukraine was clear for a long time it was not Ukraine that was the issue it was NATO and NATO's unwillingness to give the Russian security guarantees that go back for 20 years they promised the Russians no eastward expansion 
they promised that they would consider a, a neutrality of Ukraine. And then after the February 2014 coup, Ukraine became a launching ground for provocations against Russia. And, and so what we're seeing is a ganging up by the United States and the British in particular to pressure the Europeans to go along with the idea that Russia is the bully, the aggressor, and Russia has to be stopped. And what President Putin said is, we have nowhere to go. You're moving weapons right up to our border. Now, the question that you ask, I mean, this is a recipe for disaster. Uh, and I'm not sure the German people want to spend an extra hundred billion dollars on defense, especially when the roads are terrible here, the trains are breaking down, bridges are collapsing, uh, education system is in trouble. Why are we spending another hundred billion dollars to confront Russia? And I think this gets to the, the bigger question. The real issue and I think in this, uh, Prime Minister Khan is right, blocks are not the solution. If you divide the world into blocks, you have a geopolitical recipe for disaster. Instead, we need, and this is what the Schiller Institute is calling for, and Mrs. Helga Zepp-LaRouche, our chairman, we need a conference to draft a new security architecture which protects the security of all sovereign nations. And along with that, the financial security of all nations. You mentioned the International Monetary Fund. We need credit for development, not debt collectors. And Correct. this is the way you can get out of this kind of crisis. So you're absolutely right, and I, I agree with the ambassador that it's heading toward a catastrophe, but it's possible to step back from it if you realize that the policy of the West has been provoking Russia instead of provoking we need more diplomacy. That's how we got out of the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, real yep. diplomacy. And so far on the Western side, we haven't seen that. Now, uh, uh, talking to you, Mr. Ambassador, a couple of important points, like, uh, for example, Turkey. If you remember, uh, during this uh, uh, issue regarding Syria, the Americans were there, Russians were there, uh, Turkey had shot down a jet of uh, Syria and then later an F-16 of Turkey shot down a jet of Russia and interestingly the 10 billion dollars worth of tourism coming in from Russia to Turkey was stopped remittances because a lot of uh, people from Turkey work in Russia stopped and a lot of pressure was also developed Turkey is a member of NATO but not a member of European Union and even at that time I remember Turkey was left all alone Americans did not support them up till that level. Over here, when you talk about the Ukrainian crisis, Ambassador, we have learned that uh, Ukraine is neither a member of NATO nor a member of European Union. But interestingly, let's suppose if it becomes a member, a permanent member of European Union, but not a NATO member, will that sort out the issue? Or perhaps it's kind of a mix and match, sir, because if the Europeans or the Americans want one country to be used in a certain way, they'll use it against their adversaries like Turkey, same the case seems to be in case of Ukraine. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a great country, I would say, but again, uh, I, I guess Mr. Zelensky was expecting a little too much from the Western world, and a little has been given, and that also too late. That's very correct. In fact, uh, uh, the examples which you have cited about Turkey, and then you uh, came over to Ukraine, if they become a member of the European Union and not the NATO. In fact, the entire efforts, if we just try and backtrack uh, all these um, developments which has been taken place, uh, taking place after uh, 2014, um, uh, then we'll probably come to one conclusion that every time there has been an effort, particularly after uh, Lithuania, Lithuania, Estonia, and uh, the Eastern uh, European countries, once they were um, uh, taken into the lap of the NATO forces. And every time the Russians have been making their observation and point that please don't really uh, come close to our doorsteps and start deploying the missiles and start weaponizing this area, particularly under the backdrop of the 1991, perhaps the, uh, the, the understanding that there won't be expansion. And it has been already mentioned, there won't be expansion of NATO to eastward. Uh, Putin was very clear, in fact, uh, uh, and from even international point 
say, say law point of view, yes, there is a violation if we see it from a one single dimension that's a violation of uh, Article 51 of the UN Charter that each country's uh, sovereignty and territorial and in integrity has to be respected and no other country should really um, by force uh, violate that. So that's to that extent, yes, but what is the backdrop of it? And if we go and stretch that, then, then probably we can draw the uh, strength what Russia did. And uh, once there's a debate in General Assembly, probably we'll hear about the General Assembly Resolution 2649 as well once the people of uh, Ukraine started asking for the Russian help and uh, support. And that's how the two territories of Ukraine were uh, declared independence and Russia immediately recognized and established its diplomatic effort. Bottom line is that Russians, it was the question of their life and death if the entire NATO had the access on their, their doorsteps to make all the deployments and Russia would keep quiet there. So that development was writing on the wall that they would they had drawn a deadline and uh, Putin has been mentioning it time and again, time and again that look, you know, just don't accept Ukraine into, don't bring Ukraine into your fold of NATO. And if that happens, then that would be a, a red line. Uh, uh, and it was as simple. That's what is going to happen if they want to de-escalate because the situation has reached to a level that Russia is not going to really, um, uh, yes, probably Russia might as well withdraw from its demand that roll back, roll back net from the Eastern Europe and particularly the countries which I mentioned. To that extent, perhaps, but not from the Ukraine, it appears, because they understand about their national security priority. So from that, well, yes. And if, if uh, uh, the, uh, the Ukraine only joins the European Union, then that, that, that would be a different thing, that they would not be able to, and Russia would have a full monitoring, they would not be able to deploy their weapons on the doorstep, although that would also create some botheration, but that, to my mind, would not be an uh, not, not, not be a violation of any international law at that uh, the particular stage. Here, at this particular point, there is just one violation, and that is the understanding and the accord, which was uh, uh, reached to a level of understanding in 1991. So from that angle, yes, but then all these things, what is going to happen to a country, and I don't know how Pakistan, uh, 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 our Minister of Finance and the Prime Minister is going to manage that, because the Procter & Gamble, it says that the oil prices, Brent oil prices would go 150. If this escalates yeah, that is further, what they, they say. 150 means our uh, uh, petroleum prices, the fuel prices would go high by about 30-40%. Uh, so how we uh, Ambassador, if you remember, if you remember, uh, in 2007-8, before the recession, uh, the oil prices did touch $147 a barrel. Remember? But Very dollar in Pakistan at that time was hovering around 60-61. And we managed to, uh, you know, uh, control that. But if this time it hits, this is going to be not only a problem for, for a country like Pakistan, which is an oil importing country, but for a lot of other countries as well. Now, uh, coming to you, uh, Mr. Harley, one important point, and that is about the double standards of the West. Let me be very straight here, sir. Whenever America wants to invade any country, rightfully or wrongfully, whether it's Iraq or Afghanistan or any other Muslim country, sir, they would come test all their weapons there at the cost of those countries, so-called the allies like Saudi Arabia or, or Kuwait for that matter, or UAE, and then they would display their weapons, they would use them, and they would create a disaster. What they did in Iraq, I think one of the best uh, Middle Eastern countries, uh, their infrastructure was ruined after the bombing. So the case was with Afghanistan, where so-called they believe that $2.2 trillion was spent. God knows where they, they spend that kind of money. But my point is, sir, Americans can, against all odds, they'll say that, wow, you know, this is against our, uh, our national uh, security or perhaps there is a threat emanating from Afghanistan, for God's sake. What kind of a threat would be emanating from those uh, caves? But, sir, when there is a real threat to a country like Russia uh, and the entire West is its adversary, unfortunately, despite the fact that the West depends on them as well, especially the European countries, uh, that man says that, you know, you are going to have your missiles right at my doorstep, in my porch, this was the word, and you keep on pushing him and eventually this is what he does. Now, sir, America has not fought any war 
on their own soil. Two attacks. One was Pearl Harbor and during the Second World War. Second was 9-11. They don't care, to be very honest, sir. But don't you think this is going to be a mega, mega disaster uh, for the European Union? This is time that keep the Americans aside and let's talk. That is the way to move forward. Otherwise, whether it's Russia or it's European Union, they would be back in the 19th century, sir. Well, my personal view is that this does go back to 19th century geopolitics, the British view of the world. You divide the East and West. You have no relationship between Eurasia and Europe. As long as you keep them divided, the British can rule the world. And we've seen the results of that. Two world wars in the last century. Now, your question about NATO and, and the West, the hypocrisy is just unbelievable. What was done in Afghanistan, and, and this, people are still suffering from it. When NATO and the U.S. went into Iraq, when they went into Libya, when they went into the Balkans in 1999, you know, they're talking about Russia going into Ukraine as though this is something that's never happened before. But the West has been doing it over and over and over. So the, the lack of recognition of people like Blinken and, and Liz Truss, the, the British foreign minister who's out there with blood dripping from her teeth as she talks about Russia, as though she forgets what was done in India by the British or what was done in Ireland by the British and so on. Now, the point is you can make the, the blame all you want. I think what President Putin said was reasonable and legitimate, that Russia's security depends on keeping Ukraine neutral, not bringing NATO in, not bringing weapons in. And this is why we need to have a conference that takes up this question of a security architecture. No nation is safe unless all nations' security is recognized. And you need an international conference for that. And that's what, what we're calling for. That's the, we're circulating a, a petition calling for prominent people to come out and say that instead of trying to bankrupt Russia with the SWIFT policy. But that, that, that is what the, the main plan is to go after them and, uh, you know, make sure that... Uh, as far as their economy is concerned, that should feel uh, the heat. Last quick comment from you, uh, Mr. Harley. Mr. Vladimir uh, Zelensky says that uh, all the prisoners who have some sort of a combat experience should come and join us in the streets. He himself, along with the other parliamentarians, are wearing the uh, jackets and carrying guns. We do understand, sir, a guerrilla warfare kind of a situation has already developed. A lot of Russian casualties have also been reported because it's a different ball game and you're having those anti-tank missiles and all. Number point is, sir, an Afghanistan-like situation could be in Ukraine that could be prolonged where exactly what happened uh, during the Soviet invasion could happen again here, sir, with a lot of uh, Western support. Could Ukraine be, could be the new Afghanistan, sir, for Russia? Well, I, I think the problem is that when President Zelensky wanted to negotiate, he was told he couldn't by Biden and, and by others. And then when they went to him, Macron and Schultz went to him after talking to Putin. By that point, Biden said, no deal. We're, we're not going to make an a, agreement with Russia. Russia's security guarantees are off the table. And so President Putin reacted not only to the refusal to discuss security guarantees, but to the economic warfare that's been launched in the last 48 hours, which is designed to cripple Russia. And it yes. was even on January 25th, the meeting at the White House said, we must destroy Russia's economy. Two senior administration officials said that in a press briefing. So the Russians were put against the wall. Now. The hope there is that President Putin has made his concerns heard, that the Ukrainians, instead of sending prisoners into the streets to die on behalf of NATO and Western bankers, which is what's happening. And Ukraine has not been served well by the post-2014 economic policy. The International Monetary Fund has made Ukraine the poorest country in Europe. Correct. So I think it's, I think it's crucial that we have a conference that takes up security guarantees, a new security architecture, and an economic plan where countries work together, including with the Belt and Road Initiative of China and the Eurasian integration plans, of which Pakistan is 
has a major role to play Absolutely. as opposed to dividing into blocks and fighting wars. Otherwise, we are doomed. You know, the Afghan situation would be uh, preferable to a nuclear war, but no one wants that. War is horrible and it has to stop. All right. I would like to say thank you very much, gentlemen, uh, for your comments and for your observation. And uh, that's all we have uh, for this. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow at 8.05. Till then, you take good care. Khuda Hafiz.